Welcome back to our series of questions and answers. In our last session, we asked the question, how should we read the Bible? And in this session, we're going to ask the question, is the Bible really all about Jesus? Perhaps you've heard somebody say that in a sermon or a Bible study, that the whole Bible is about Christ, but they never really explained it. Or perhaps you've encountered uh, teachings where uh, some part of the Bible was connected to Jesus in a way that surprised you and you thought, can you really do that? Is that what the Bible is really about? Well, in this session, we're going to look at what Jesus himself says about the Bible being about him, right? What Jesus himself claims uh, when he says that the Bible is all about him. And then we're also going to look at how the whole Bible, how various parts of the Bible all point to Jesus. And then we'll look at some specific examples that uh, may be surprising to you, but that are uh, places where Jesus is, um, is pointed to or prophesied or anticipated in uh, the Old Testament, not just the ones that are, are obvious or that are made clear in the New Testament, but again, some that may be new to you or may be surprising to you to help us see how uh, the Bible really is all about Jesus. So let's start with what Jesus himself claims. In two particular passages, uh, Jesus makes very plain that the Bible is ultimately about him. One of those is John chapter 5. And in John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40, Jesus says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So Jesus says, the scriptures, you, you think you have eternal life in the scriptures themselves, but the scriptures bear witness to me. They point to me, and they're pointing you to me, and yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Jesus is the one who has life, and the scriptures point us to him that we might find life in him. But the people Jesus was talking to, they were trying to find life in the scriptures themselves and not coming to Jesus, which means they were missing the point of the scriptures. And he goes on to say a few verses later in John 5, 45 to 47, he says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So Jesus goes on to say that uh, Moses himself, right, the author of the first five books of the Bible, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, right, written through Moses, um, Moses wrote about Jesus. And if they really believed Moses, they would also believe Jesus now that Jesus is here, but uh, because because Moses wrote about Jesus, right? But he says, but if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So Jesus claims that the scriptures are about him. They point to him so that we can find life in him. Jesus says that uh, Moses himself, the author, uh, under again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, author of the foundational books of the Bible, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, he wrote about Jesus as well. And then the second key passage is in Luke 24. And there are two sets of verses from Luke 24 I want to draw your attention to. This is after Jesus' death and resurrection, and he's speaking to his disciples. And uh, in this first occasion, in Luke 24, 25 to 27, he's speaking to uh, two men uh, among his disciples who he's He's walking with on the road to Emmaus, and he says to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus says, Look, the prophets you're not believing all that the prophets have spoken because they, they knew about Jesus' death and they had heard um, rumors, I guess you could say, of his resurrection, but did not yet believe it. And uh, so uh, Jesus is saying, wasn't it necessary for the Messiah, the Christ, to suffer 
and enter into his glory. In other words, shouldn't you have understood from the prophets that this is what was going to happen? So earlier, Jesus was saying, Moses wrote about me. Now he's saying, if you understood the prophets, you would have understood that I had to suffer and then enter into my glory. And then it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them uh, to them in the scriptures, all the things concerning himself. So he just started going through Moses and the prophets saying, this is about me and this is about me. See how this points to me. See how this was anticipating and 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 uh, showing you what was going to happen to me. And then several verses later in Luke 24, 44 to 47, uh, he says, and now he's with, I think, a, an expanded group of his disciples. Um, he says, it says, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So Jesus says, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now, in John 5, he mentioned Moses. Earlier in John 24, he mentioned the prophets. Now he mentions Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And those three categories uh, refer to the three uh, categories of the Hebrew scriptures, right? What we call the Old Testament, uh, the way that Jews uh, organized, uh, again, what we call the Old Testament, um, uh, what's often called the Hebrew Bible, uh, is the law, the prophets, and the writings. And the Psalms is the the chief uh, book of the writings. So those are the three categories, in other words, of the scriptures that the Jews had at that point. The New Testament, of course, hadn't been written. And so those are the three categories of scripture that they had. Those are the same books that we have in our Old Testament today. Jesus says in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, in all of these scriptures, right? It, uh, he said everything that written about me in those three categories of scripture must be fulfilled. And then he, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, it says, And then he said to them, here's what the scriptures say, right? That the Christ should suffer, that on the third day he would rise from the dead, and that repentance and the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed to his name in all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Now we'll come back to those three categories a little bit later, but um, it's clear that Jesus is saying, look, the gospel, Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, and the preaching of the gospel, the call to people to repent and have their sins forgiven, Uh, in Jesus' name, starting from Jerusalem, that was all there, he's saying, in the Old Testament scriptures. So uh, if you want to see some specific examples of how the apostles uh, put into practice what Jesus is teaching them here, how they themselves connected uh, the Old Testament scriptures to Christ and showed how they were fulfilled, uh, read Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. Read any of the sermons, really, in the book of Acts. And of course, there are other places you can see that as well. But those are really clear examples of how they brought together Old Testament scripture and showed how it was fulfilled in Christ. So yes, Jesus himself says that the scriptures are about him. The Old Testament is about him, that the scriptures point to him, they're fulfilled in him, they uh, prophesy about him. Yes, the whole Bible is about Jesus, because the Old Testament is about Jesus, and of course, the New Testament is about Jesus, um, and that that that's more self-evident, right, that the New Testament is about Jesus. The difficult part is the Old Testament, but Jesus says that shouldn't be difficult. It is all pointing to me, right? All of the scripture, all the Old Testament scripture is pointing to me. Uh, in fact, we can even go through sort of each category of scripture, each section of scripture, and, and see just broadly how they point to Christ. For example, if we look at the law in the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible, what the Jews call the Torah, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. How does that point to Christ? Well, from the very beginning in Genesis 3, God promises that there's going to be a child born of the woman who will crush the serpent's head. That's a That's a promise, that's a prophecy about the coming of Jesus. In Deuteronomy 18, Moses 
uh, prophesies promises about the coming of a prophet like him, which is a, a prophecy pointing to Jesus. You can see the details of that in, uh, in Deuteronomy 18. Um, and all through we see, uh, the, the law, we see patterns and promises that are ultimately fulfilled in Christ. For example, uh, in the story of Joseph, Joseph um, suffers, right? He's, he's um, persecuted by his brothers. He's thrown into a pit. He's taken as a slave into Egypt, and then he is exalted. He's raised up to being second in command uh, only under Pharaoh himself in Egypt. That forms a pattern, right, that Jesus follows, um, that has been called uh, by scholars, I think, the, the pattern of the, the righteous sufferer, right, that this is a, a righteous individual. Joseph was faithful. We're not told hardly anything bad about Joseph, though he was a sinner like everybody else. We're not told hardly anything bad about him. He suffered and then was raised up. Uh, that pattern is followed by David later as well. And then it's uh, ultimately uh, fulfilled in Jesus, right? Who humbled himself, who came to the earth as a man. And he was persecuted. He was blasphemed. But ultimately he was exalted after his death and burial. He was raised from the dead and exalted to God's right hand. So you see patterns uh, that are fulfilled in Christ. And you also see promises. The promises God made to Abraham of land and offspring and blessing. Those uh, particularly the, the promise of offspring, are ultimately fulfilled in Christ. It's ultimately the Messiah, Jesus, who would come from uh, Abraham's line, who is the fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham. And we, we see that spelled out for us in, um, in Galatians chapter 3. So in the law, we see, um, we see these kinds of patterns, promises, prophecies. Uh, Moses himself it points forward to Christ. Uh, Exodus thirty three eleven says, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. So God would speak to Moses face to face, and then uh, Moses, of course, would speak to the people and says, say, Thus says the Lord. Well, fulfilling and filling up that pattern, um, going beyond what was special about Moses, Jesus himself comes from the presence of God it, John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he says later, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus comes and reveals the Father, having been with the Father from eternity, right? For eternity, right? So even nearer to God, the Father, than Moses was, and Jesus comes to make uh, God known. So we see all those kinds of things in, in the law pointing toward Jesus in the historical books, right? Uh, the books like Joshua, Judges, and so on. Um, God preserves, how, how do those point to Jesus? Well, God is preserving uh, his people from which the Messiah is going to come, even through their sin, idolatry, rebellion, exile, uh, etc. God maintains his people, he preserves his people, he keeps his promises to his people so that ultimately he can bring the Messiah into the world through his people as he promised. If you look at the wisdom literature like Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, uh, the, the easiest one from that group of writings is what we call, is the book of Psalms, right? And the Psalms point to Jesus in countless ways and Jesus himself draws our attention to the Psalms, especially in uh, the words he speaks from, from the cross as he's being crucified, like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which comes from Psalm 22. Um, and um, it's very apparent from things Jesus says and, and other things that we see in the New Testament that the Psalms are fulfilled in Christ. Um, the prophets, of course, prophesied the coming of Christ, like Isaiah when he speaks of the child born of a virgin. And um, Isaiah 9, when he speaks of the son who would be born, who would sit on David's throne. Uh, Micah 5 says that uh, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Uh, it also speaks in the prophets of the work of Christ. Isaiah 53 is the clearest, explaining how his death would uh, provide atonement for sin. Uh, it speaks of the new covenant in the, in the, the prophets that Jesus would secure for us by his blood in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. So the Gospels, I mean, the, the, the prophets point to Christ. The historical books, the prophets, the law, 
All of the Old Testament points to Christ. The Gospels, of course, are about Christ himself, about his birth, life, death, resurrection, his teaching, his ministry, who he is, right? Uh, in the, and then in Acts, Jesus continues to work as he sends the Spirit to um, empower his disciples to bear witness about him throughout the world. Jesus himself appears to Saul and converts him and, and calls him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, the letters of the New Testament explain and expound what Jesus accomplished, who he is, what he did, why it matters, and how we should live now as followers of Christ. And then, of course, the book of Revelation there at the end is the revelation of Jesus Christ. We see Jesus in all of his glory in the book of Revelation and see how uh, he wins. He is the conqueror of death and Hades, the, the one who defeated our enemy, Satan, that ancient serpent, uh, the book of Revelation calls him. So the whole Bible from beginning to end, Old Testament and New Testament, yes, is all about Jesus. All right, now, what are some specific passages that uh, can help us see how this works, right? Now, again, some are obvious, right? Some are pretty clear, like, for example, Genesis 22, uh, where God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac, and he's called, Isaac is called his um, beloved son or his only son, um, and uh, God, is, uh, God tells Abraham to sacrifice him, and then God provides a ram at the last moment instead to be sacrificed in Isaac's place. And, of course, that points to God being willing to give his son, right, Jesus, as um, the, the one who would die in our place as our substitute, just like the ram died in Isaac's place, um, also, the, we already mentioned, you know, Psalm 22. If you read Psalm 22, thinking about the crucifixion at all, it's very clear that that is a psalm anticipating the suffering of Christ uh, in his crucifixion. It was written by David about a thousand years before Jesus was crucified. But it's clearly uh, anticipating um, Jesus' crucifixion. We mentioned Isaiah 53 already. That one also if you know anything about the death of Jesus and what it accomplished, reading Isaiah 53, it's very obvious that that's what it, uh, that passage is about. Daniel 7, with the vision of the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man who comes before the Ancient of Days and receives an eternal kingdom. Very clearly also about Jesus, right? About uh, Jesus as the King, right? So um, there's some that are really clear. Others are not as obvious on their own until Jesus or someone in the New Testament, you know, one of the writers, Paul or Peter or somebody, draws our attention to them and says, look, don't you see how this has to be about Jesus? One of those would be Psalm 110 verse 1, where David says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand and until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Jesus himself brings up this psalm in Matthew 22, and he says, um, you know, okay, they, the, Jesus and the Pharisees agree that David's writing the psalm, that he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, and that the Messiah is going to come from David's line, as God promised, and that's back in the historical books, right? Um, and they, they agree on that, and so they, Jesus' question then is, Okay, David's talking about the Messiah in this psalm. How can David call the Messiah, who is his son, Lord? Because he says, the Lord, Yahweh, God, says to my Lord, the Messiah, sit at my right hand. How can David call the Messiah his Lord? That psalm is about Jesus, in other words. It's about the Messiah. The question is... How can the Messiah who comes from David's line also be David's Lord? The answer, of course, is that the Messiah is God in the flesh. So he's even greater than David, even though, according to the flesh, he's David's son. But you and I, just reading Psalm 110, we might not have picked up on that until Jesus draws our attention to it. The writer of Hebrews uh, brings our attention to that passage as well. Um, you can say the same thing about uh, Psalm 45, which is brought up in Hebrews 1, also about um, Jesus, the Messiah. 
Um, Isaiah 6 is another one where we might not would naturally connect it to Jesus, where Isaiah is, sees his vision of the Lord high and lifted up, and um, he is undone because he's aware of his sin in the face of God's holiness. And um, God says, you know, who shall go and, and uh, who shall I send and who shall go for us? And, uh, and then he tells Isaiah, you know, what his ministry is going to be like and, and so on. And John, in John 12, 41, or just before John 12, 41, he quotes part of Isaiah chapter 6. And then he says something that's surprising to us, at least at first. He says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory, meaning Jesus' glory. That's who John's talking about there in John 12. Because he saw his glory and spoke of him. So he's saying, Isaiah, when he saw the, his vision of the Lord high lifted up, he saw Jesus. He saw the Son of God. So Isaiah 6 is about Jesus, right? Not just Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 53, but Isaiah 6 also points forward to Jesus if we understand it correctly. Right? So there are plenty of passages like that where the New Testament makes clear a connection that we might not otherwise have seen. Um, but there are others that may not be explicitly or directly or clearly um, marked by the New Testament, either by Jesus or the apostles, as being fulfilled in Christ. But we have a framework from Jesus and the apostles where we can look at other passages of Scripture and see, yes, that's about Jesus too. And, and what I want to do here is use when Jesus said in Luke 24 um, that, uh, let's see, let's go back here, Luke 24, where he said, uh, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things uh, and enter into his glory? <clears throat> oh, wait, excuse me, not that one. Later, where he says, um, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. I want to use those three categories of his suffering, his resurrection on the third day, and, um, and the forgiveness of sins and repentance being preached from Jerusalem are there places where we see those uh, prophesied or pointed to in the Old Testament in some perhaps surprising places? Well, uh, yes, there are. Uh, let me start with, with Jesus' suffering. Is there a place in the Old Testament that points to the suffering of Christ in a way that might surprise us? Well, again, God promised David that one of his sons that uh, would sit on his throne forever Right? The Messiah was going to come from David's throne. Isaiah talks about that in Isaiah 9, uh, that the Savior would come from David's line. And so David functions as a, a pattern or an anticipation of the Messiah. His life, in other words, points us toward what Jesus is going to be like, what the Messiah is going to be like when he comes. And so we see the same pattern in David's life that we saw, uh, we mentioned in Joseph's life, where David, except it's even more clear here, David is anointed as king, though he's a young man, youngest of his brothers. He's anointed as king while Saul is still on the throne. And Saul, of course, is not excited about that. And so how does Saul respond? Saul persecutes David. He pursues David. He tries to kill David until eventually Saul dies and then David is exalted. He's seated on the throne. That anticipates, again, the pattern of Jesus' life. He comes into the world as the Son of God who's taken on flesh, born of a virgin, born as a man, and he is rejected, despised, he's persecuted, people are trying to kill him, they're trying to arrest him, they're trying to get rid of him. But in his case, it's not until he dies, right, by his, his at his crucifixion, and then is buried, that then he's raised from the dead and exalted to God's right hand to sit on the throne of the universe as king. So his suffering is anticipated, not just in particular passages like Isaiah 53 or Psalm 22, but even in the pattern of David's life, the pattern of Joseph's life. What about his resurrection on the third day? Well, uh, there is a hint of that in Genesis 22. Now we said Genesis 22 pretty clearly points to um, Jesus in the sense that Isaac is Abraham's only son. 
and God calls Abraham to sacrifice his only son, but God provides a ram as a substitute, just as Jesus, as God's only begotten son, is going to be offered, except there won't be anyone to take Jesus' place because Jesus is taking our place when he dies on the cross. But there's even more that points to Christ, specifically to his resurrection here in Genesis 22, when it says, um, God, so God calls him to sacrifice his son, tells him to go to the place uh, where he'll show him, and then it says, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Notice this, on the third day, this is verse 4 of Genesis 22, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. So Abraham is told to sacrifice his son. It's on the third day that he comes to the place where that sacrifice is supposed to happen, but God provides a substitute instead. And Abraham seems to believe that somehow his son will come back with him because that's what he tells his men. We're going to go over there and worship and then we're going to come back. And the book of Hebrews even says in Hebrews chapter 11 that, uh, I forget the exact wording, but basically says that um, Abraham um, believed that if necessary, God could raise Isaac from the dead, which the writer of Hebrews says in a way he did. Because if you think about it, from the day that God said, you need to kill your son, Isaac was in some sense, I mean, he wasn't dead, of course, but he was under a sentence of death, right? But then it's on the third day that Abraham receives his son back alive, as it were, no longer under the sentence of death because God has provided a substitute for him instead. And that happened on the third day. So that points forward to Jesus dying. And it's not necessarily like a, a prediction per se, but it is a pointer. It is an anticipation where looking back, we can see how God was preparing us for what he was going to do with his own son, raising him from the dead on the third day. What about that last part about forgiveness and repentance of sin being proclaimed in Jesus's name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Is that uh, prophesied or pointed to somewhere in the Old Testament? It is. In Isaiah chapter 2, this is what I think Jesus has in mind when he says, uh, when he says that this is in the Old Testament, that the gospel will be preached from, the, from Jerusalem. It says in Isaiah 2, beginning in verse 2, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it, and many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. And then notice this, For out of Zion, Jerusalem, shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, there's lots of um, that we could say about how this all works, but Jesus is the fulfillment of the temple, right? Jesus dies uh, in Jerusalem. In fact, he even connects his death to the temple in John chapter 2 when he says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up, right? So Jesus dies just outside of Jerusalem. He's the fulfillment of the temple. And when he dies, then he has his, and, and rises from the dead, he has his disciples stay in Jerusalem uh, until they receive the Holy Spirit. And then from there, he sends them out to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth to bear witness about him, John, uh, Acts 1 says, right? So Isaiah 2, when it says the word of the Lord is going to go out from Zion, right? And that all the nations are going to flow toward Jerusalem. And many are going to come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord that he may teach us his ways. I think that's anticipating the people who are going to flock to Jesus, right? The fulfillment of the temple who died there in Jerusalem. They're not necessarily physically coming to Jerusalem at this point, but they are, they are streaming to Jesus, right? The one who's crucified and raised in Jerusalem. And from Jerusalem is coming the testimony about Jesus and the call to repent and believe so that your sins can be forgiven. That's flowing out of Jerusalem as well. So that that, again, not as uh, obvious a connection, but nonetheless, 
a real one. And then the final one I'll mention is the destruction and rebuilding of the temple itself. This one, some of you have heard me say before, um, this one for me came from pondering an illustration in a, a children's Bible that was uh, trying to illustrate how the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus. In the Old Testament, when the Jews uh, rejected God's covenant, they sinned against him, they rebelled against him. One of the things that happened was uh, God brought their enemies against them. They destroyed the temple and carried them off into exile. And then later God brought them back into exile and they were allowed to rebuild the temple. And as I already mentioned, Jesus connects the destruction and rebuilding of the temple to himself and to his death and resurrection in John 2 when he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. First of all, indicating that he is the fulfillment of the temple. The temple is the dwelling place of God in the midst of his people. Jesus is God himself in the midst of his people. But the destruction and rebuilding of the temple in the Old Testament points forward to the fact that when the Messiah came as God in the midst of his people, he too would be destroyed in a sense, torn down in a sense, as he died, right? And then rebuilt. The temple was rebuilt and he was raised. So even the story of the, the destruction and rebuilding of the temple points ultimately to Christ. So is the whole Bible about Jesus? Absolutely it is. From the beginning to the end and everything in between, all of the Bible ultimately points to Jesus. The whole Bible is about him. That's what Jesus claimed. That's what the apostles preached. And once he opens our eyes to see it, that's what we see when we read the scriptures. May it be increasingly true of us that everywhere we look in the Bible, we see pointers to Jesus. God bless.